Hello. Aloha. Two years ago, with no family history, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. It was stage four. Getting diagnosed at stage four usually gives you a life expectancy of about three to four years. And there is no cure. My doctor gave me a 30% chance for survival with a very aggressive chemotherapy plan. Four months after that, my scans showed no signs of disease. All trouble areas had completely resolved. This is not normal. <laughs> so how did I do that? Well, first of all, I didn't do it alone. Um, with my mom and sister in Washington State, where I grew up, um, I was very lucky to have friends here locally step up to help me. They helped me purge my kitchen. Uh, I had to start all over and radically change the way I eat. Um, everything was coming from earth now. Everything that I was eating came from earth. Avocado, ulu, kalo, um, tons of fruits and vegetables and nuts and beans for protein. My body was now a sacred temple, and I was very mindful of everything that I was putting in it. And I didn't just detoxify my body, I also detoxified my house. So my detergent, my shampoo, toothpaste, deodorant, everything was all natural now, no toxins. I learned how to alkalize my cells, I was drinking aluminum-free baking soda every morning, and um, I was putting lemon in my water that I was drinking by the gallon now each day. I, through what I can only say was a miracle, I was introduced to something called holistic medicine, and I found a naturopathic doctor who specializes in cancer here. And he got me on a regimen of supplements um, right away. Citrus pectin, turkey tail mushrooms, and high doses of melatonin at night while I slept, which not only can kill the cancer cells, but it also can keep it from spreading. He gave me high-dose vitamin C, IV, 50 grams each week directly into my blood. I did acupuncture, Reiki, uh, hyperbaric oxygen, and I learned yoga. I separated myself from as much negative energy as I could, which meant I didn't drive. <laughs> uh, I stayed away from dramatic people, work, stress, um, TV, movies, especially social media. Uh, I didn't want to tell anyone at first or post about it, um, mainly because I just didn't want anyone, I didn't want to bum anyone out. But also, I just didn't want to induce this pity party that I, I didn't need because I didn't want to be around any belief or energy that I was going to die. I've always been a writer, though. That's, that's me. Writing and sharing is me and my true self. So once I did decide my treatment plan, uh, I did sit down and write a post on my blog and I also began sharing my day-to-day -day with a story-sharing app called Snapchat. And um, this was 2015, so there were hardly any adults that knew what that app was. In fact, <laughs> in fact everybody that I know that has it, they, they downloaded it for, because they heard that I was sharing through this app, and they wanted to make sure I was okay and uh, cheer me on. So, you know, I found that sharing, it had a much more positive effect than I was expecting, and it became therapeutic. I now had this, this audience of supporters that um, were keeping me accountable for my routines. Their, just their comments and their letters, the DMs, their snaps, everything. Um, but also, you know, people were coming over to my house and just dropping off boxes of organic fruit or avocados from their tree or mailing me packages of organic skincare or essential oils. The way the community here stepped up to support me 
was a very, very positive experience. And I'm sure that that is a lot, has a lot to do with how quickly I healed. So just when I think I can do no wrong, I'm the woman who killed her stage four cancer. Uh, I've, I've had six months of scans with no signs of disease still. So I'm on top of the world. And then my doctor in an exam feels a lump under my arm. I had to go back for biopsy and all the workups, all the scans. And I was just thinking, no, there's no way. There's no way this body has cancer. No, I got rid of that. But um, in May of 2016, which was exactly a year from my first initial diagnosis, not only did the cancer come back, it exploded, um, is what my doctor described it as, all over my lungs, three spots in my liver, and 40 spots in my brain in two hemispheres. <laughs> my life expectancy dropped from years to months, just like that. How did I get through that? <laughs> well, as a hormone receptor positive disease, my ovaries, they immediately took them out, or what I like to call overnight menopause. Um, <laughs> then whole brain radiation, they just, you know, they burn your head from the inside out. And that takes about six months. And, but at this point, I just, I knew that making this body just so strong wasn't enough and I knew I had to go deeper and I needed to work on my soul. I met with a few different types of spirit guides. Um, one Hawaiian spiritual healer told me that he did a soul pattern profile and he knew, he said, anger is the root of your cancer. Something that happened when you were three or four years old between you, a man, and a woman. He, he wrote this to me before we even met. That was his first, like, initial thing. And as it turns out, when I was three is when my mom left my dad. And I never got to have a relationship with my dad. And I could see in the baby pictures how much we loved each other and just our smiles were so big. And this is someone I never knew. So I figured there's no better time to try to find him, right? Get to establish that relationship. He was really easy, actually, to find online. And um, I, I emailed him. He emailed me right back and very warmly. And we agreed that he would come here to Hawaii, where he's never been, to meet the daughter he's never was able to watch grow up, become a woman. And... Uh, <laughs> I'll never forget that feeling of first meeting and seeing him and his big smile, which was just like mine. And we were both just laughing and crying and hugging. And I mean, I could physically feel all of this pain and resentment that I didn't even know I was harboring, just releasing and melting away. And it was the, it was the first time in my life, in 37 years that I knew what it felt like, that I accepted such unconditional love from a man, that spiritual block was over my heart, and the cancer started over my heart, 10 centimeters over my heart. You know, cancer treatment, it's just ups and downs, like a roller coaster. And sometimes you feel like you're just free-falling. Um, a lot of cancer patients, when they're at stage four, they're in the hospital, in and out of the hospital, quite often. Uh, I was only hospitalized for four days. This is not normal. <laughs> um, I feel like the closest that I ever came to death through this whole thing was when my chemotherapy port got infected. Um, that's like a surgically inserted cath that goes to a major vein so they can give you all the chemo dumped into your um, blood system. And it's, I always thought it was funny that the very thing that was supposed to be administering this life-saving poison, my body was rejecting it. Um, but I wanted to tell you about the chemo too because my doctor did prescribe a very aggressive chemotherapy plan, two rounds of very strong drugs, the first one 12 infusions, 
But after like two or three infusions, she could physically feel that tumor shrinking by about a centimeter each, each visit. And she knew I was taking an integrative approach, so she agreed to take me off of one of those two drugs just to see. And I was still shrinking rapidly each week, a centimeter or more. So after a few more infusions, she dropped the dose. of. So I was only doing a little bit, and I never had to do that second round. So anyway, but after 10 infusions, I spiked a fever, and um, I didn't think it was a big deal, but I was lucky that I was with my friends, and they knew to call the doctor's number on my medicine bottle, and she was like, take her to the ER, go now. And I was like, and I won't forget the, the emergency room staff, the way they were fussing over me like I was some kind of trauma patient. I was like, I feel fine, you know, it's just a fever. Um, and they were saying something about septic shock and that they had to call in the infectious disease doctor. I had no idea what, what that meant. Um, I thought it might mean something with your bowels, because like septic tank. <laughs> <laughs> I found out months later that, later that um, being septic is life-threatening, and even for people with no cancer. So you can imagine how dangerous that was to have 10 infusions of chemo and no immune system and have this infection. If I had done that original chemo plan, if I wasn't with friends that night, I am sure that I would not be standing here right now. So, but if that was the closest that I ever came to death, I think the, the gnarliest part of this whole two years was the aftermath, because um, after the port got infected, they had to dig it out of my chest wall, which left like an open wound. So now I had weekly visits with this place called Wound Care at Queens Hospital, which is, it's like down this long hallway in the back of the hospital. And after my first appointment, I knew why. Um, and it's because, so the other patients don't hear our screams. Oh, they have, it's this tool is like a melon baller, but it's small and metal. And they use it to dig around in your open wound to stimulate new tissue growth. And, oh, this is done with no sedation. And everybody in there is just doing their best not to scream. And some people just don't even care. And you want to be brave. Ugh. After, they told me that it would take two months to heal the port wound. And um, after that first appointment, I was like, no, 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 no. I doubled up on the high dose vitamin C and I did hyperbaric oxygen twice a week. And it was the third appointment that the nurse was like going to my chest and was like, huh. And she went and got someone else to come in and look. And they were like, huh, it's closed. And they brought me back this certificate of healing that is my most cherished thing. It's still on my wall. Oh. Through all of this, though, even that, I just, I always had this very strong feeling that I, it could be worse. And I just, I felt so lucky. And, you know, I, I was seeing people in the community, even my own friends getting diagnosed and getting sick and passing away. I got through all this because I stayed positive. I knew I was going to be OK. And it wasn't until months later when a nurse friend, I told her about the ER, and she, her eyes got all big like the people in the ER. She's like, <gasps> she's like, Krista, septic means organ failure. And I was like, oh, yeah. She's like, that's how you die. That's and I was like, whoa, it's a good thing I didn't know that when I was in the ER. Because that fear, who knows what the outcome could have been then if I, was, if I knew that. I mean, I really was like, guys, I'm fine. I feel fine. And so I was blissfully oblivious. So anyway, that brings me to today, here, standing here. Do I look like I'm dying? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The truth is that none of us know when it's our turn. And each day that we're waking up, we're so lucky. And this is another chance. Each moment is so sacred. 
I know for me too with this illness that as long as I am doing what I can to keep my body and my mind and my spirit sacred, that I'm going to be okay. Thank you.